and there's something logistical uh, that's happened, which basically means we'll just send you a permission code and we'll give you detailed instructions about how to enroll yourself. Because you'll be enrolled by the end of the day, hopefully. Um, as for the homework, uh, I don't know if, if there was any confusion, but it's not due today. It's actually due next week uh, before class uh, on Monday, um, like so a week from today. So I posted in the B courses, and so if, you're, if you've been accepted, you should already have access to that. If you don't, um, you know, please let us know. Um, I think that's it. Any questions before we start? Okay, so we kick off with our first lecture uh, of the semester, which is going to be on uh, this thing called classical dynamics, right? Which is um, really the foundation of physics, right? And so, um, yeah, in 1687. Uh, Newton uh, publishes his Principia, uh, which is his magnum opus. And it's basically a treatise about motion and gravity uh, from a mathematical standpoint. Right? And you might think, okay, well, it's another one of those things. You know, people write that kind of stuff all the time. You know, who cares? Right? Well, it was really, like, really fascinating because it was really the first time that we had like, a comprehensive framework for motion that was framed in terms of uh, math. Right? Because before that time, we didn't really, you know, there were, you know, qualitative, uh, art, you know, arguments or pictures that we had uh, for how, how the universe behaved. But it wasn't really until uh, this time that we had, first of all, a working theory of gravity that actually could, you know, solve a lot of things. You know, but really, uh, indeed, like, you know, the foundation of calculus and, and, and the theory of motion itself, right? And so it's really, really important. Um, you know, these sort of ties together, like, our modern conception of this idea of motion, which is kind of important. Uh, and so, um, one, one important thing to know about Newton's universe is that it was a determinist. Oh, by the way, uh, I forgot to mention this as well. Uh, um, like, there's, there's going to be a lot of stuff like, that's going to be covered in this course in general, but you should not feel like you have to understand like, literally every detail, uh, because this is sort of like, you should think of it as kind of like a seminar, uh, in the sense that I would like to like, explore like, a large breadth of topics, and so you should really feel like you don't have to uh, like understand everything like completely precisely. Although, feel free to ask her, or to do so if, if you so desire. Um, yeah, um, Newton's universe is what's called deterministic. Does anyone has anyone heard that word before? Show of hands. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, deterministic is sort of kind of like what it sounds. It means that the past completely and totally determines the future. You know, deterministic etymology is pretty clear. And so what does that mean exactly? You know, what does that physically mean? That means that if I somehow were able to know the position of, and you know, speed or velocity of every particle in the universe, you know, how every particle is moving and, and how, where every particle is right now, that means I could predict everything about the future, right? A hundred years from now, tomorrow, a you know, thousand years from now, with, without any sort of uncertainty whatsoever. And that doesn't seem particularly, I mean, like, you know, nowadays we, you know, that sort of like, that, that sort of uh, deterministic picture seems to be very true and, and kind of intuitive. But if you think about it, it's, it's sort of an abstract concept because there's no way to actually know the position of every particle, right? Uh, but nevertheless, you can sort of believe in some sense that it, it probably is kind of true that like if I knew, knew where everything was right now, like, and, and things, you know, caused the future, that somehow I would know the future completely. And so we're going to run with that picture when we talk about classical dynamics. And so what did Newton actually say? Well, you probably heard that Newton's laws also, okay, past determines future complete. Uh, and so what did Newton actually say? Well, um, you know, nowadays we've formulated uh, Newton's like uh, theories into a three succinct laws. So these are called Newton's laws. You'll never guess who they're named after. And so the first law is something that goes like this. You've probably heard this before. tends to stay in motion, an object at rest tends to stay at rest. Does anyone want to tell me like, what you think that means? 
Does anyone know? Uh, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Uh, the basic idea is that when you have an object, right, like suppose I'm in space and I threw like this marker like in this direction. Okay. We're not in space, so it didn't work. Um, but it, but you know, in theory, what would happen is that the part that the that the marker would just keep going in whatever direction I threw it. Why? Uh, because unless I tug on it, push on it, pull on it, grab it, uh, exert some force, as it were, on it in some way, it will it will not change its you know motion. Right. More specifically. Uh, it, it will just keep going in a straight line, right? It will not do anything like curve. It will not do anything like slow down or speed up, right? Um, and I want to emphasize that these, these things, like you know, the changing of you know the direction or speed of a particle or an object, this is called acceleration. And the important thing to know is that it doesn't happen unless you apply for. Right? And which means that, you know, if you don't apply force, that things just keep going on forever. Okay, so that's fine. Oh, I'm short. This is not good. This is not good. I need, I need a big check. There we go. Technology. Alright. Um, and so that sort of ties together with the second law, which you might have heard of as F equals MA. Um, and you know the formula seems kind of abstract, but basically it's, it's sort of a similar statement. It means in order to change the, the speed or the direction, in other words, in order to accelerate some object, you need to apply some force. And the more the, more, the heavier it is, the more massive it is, right? Um, the more you need to push on it. And so those those laws nowadays seem kind of intuitive, but really they like they're not the most obvious thing in the world, right? Like if I have like a chair. Uh, and I push it, like, uh, let's say actually a little bit uh, more dramatically that I was like trying to move apartments uh, from the ground floor of one apartment to another, and I had like a couch that I was really attached to. So I decided I wanted to give the couch a push, and then because of the first law, it would just keep sliding all the way over to my apartment with minimal effort, right? Because, you know, it wouldn't stop until someone pushed on it the other way. But of course you know that doesn't happen, right? Because what, what actually happens is you push it, and then it just stops. You know, like, damn it, you know, whatever. Um, and, and why is that? Well, see, see, Newton took that to mean in order to keep something in motion, you have to keep pushing on it, right? But that, that picture is actually not true, you know? The real picture is that the ground is actually pushing back via friction, right? So in a way, you know, nowadays we think of this as kind of intuitive, but back then it wasn't really that obvious. Okay, um, but, but I think the more salient point actually is that these laws, one and two, are not actually always true. Did you know that? They're not always true, uh, which kind of sucks, you know, like, because, you know, laws should be either always true or result in a ticket. Um, but in this case, it should always be true and they're not. And, and what do I mean by that? I mean, like, suppose you're in a car and you slam the brakes um, and, you know, you, you feel a jolt forward. Or more, more you know, dramatically, you, you slam the brakes so hard that you fly out of the windshield, okay? Uh, what, what do you feel when that happens? Well, you feel that, um, there's a, like an, it feels like there's an invisible force pulling you forward. Or more precisely, you feel like you, you're experiencing an acceleration even though there's no force like, acting on you, right? Um, and that's sort of called like a, an inertial or fictitious force. I don't really like this word because to the person who's like in the car, like it's a very real force, right? They, they de de definitely feel it. It's not like they're not making it up, right? Um, or, you know, another example might be when you're in a carousel and it's, you know, spinning around and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you feel like a force is pulling you outwards and then another peculiar strange force called the Coriolis force, which we have an animation for at the end of class. Um, in both of those examples, right, like, are forces that when you're, like, you know, on the carousel or when you're in the car, you feel them, even though there's, like, sort of nothing, nothing touching you, you're actually exerting a force on you. So it seems in a way that these statements are kind of not true. But, but actually, that's not really the case. You know, the, the actual purpose of these laws is to say that even though the laws are not always true, it is the case that any, problem, any question you ask you know, in Newton's universe uh, can be framed in such a way that it is true. So for example, somebody in the car you know, might you know, feel the force uh, pulling them forward right, when they break. But that's only because you know, they, you know, they look to their right, they see in their cup holder there's a, cu a cup of coffee that doesn't seem to be moving. Right, so they just say, okay, well, the car must be at rest. 
Okay? But somebody sitting on the curb, you know, who's framing the problem, the exact same problem in a different way, sees that the universe does in fact behave with, with these two laws, right? They see that, well, you know, actually, uh, like, what's happening is that the car is actually feeling a force from the ground, and the person who's in the car just is moving forward in accordance with the first law, right? And so, in a way, okay, like, it's really a matter of how you frame the problem, right? In the same way, like, somebody who's sitting on the ground next to a carousel, uh, they will see uh, that, in fact, the person is not being pulled to, uh, to the side of the car carousel, but what's really happening is that they're moving forward, and the carousel is trying to change the direction, right? Okay, and so in a way, these, these laws are kind of uh, kind of instructive, but also a little bit boring in my opinion. Maybe well, what's a little bit more fruitful is the third law. And we can go back to the sofa example. So every action has an equal and opposite reaction. What, what does that mean? Broadly, what it means is, if there's a couch and I push on it, it pushes back. You know, um, it, it's it's you know it's something that you feel very intuitively, right? Like when when the, the ground holds you up, you're also exerting an equal and opposite force in the ground, right? Um, and then when I push this, you know, I might be pushing it forwards, but actually I feel a resistance uh, from the board, which is an equal and opposite magnitude, right? And so, uh, broadly, what that means is when you have one object that exerts a force on another. They both like uh, that. That second, that first object feels the exact same force uh, acting on it. I mean, that might seem like you know, kind of you know, kind of a trivial, interesting thing, but really, it's a little bit more important than that, right? Because there's actually something very insightful that comes from that. So let me just draw a picture, and then we'll we'll sort of see what happens, right? Suppose I have like two particles, two two like balls or, or something, you know, or ping pong balls. And then let's say one of them is like sort of moving up like pretty fast, the other one's moving down really slow, just in one dimension so we can see. So at some later time, this, part of, this particle will have moved a little bit further, and then it will have moved a little bit further, and so on. Uh, and this particle will have moved a little bit, and this particle will have moved a little bit, this particle will have moved a little bit, right? Um, but it turns out that there's this something called the center of mass, right? Uh, which is going to be like sort of, it's not going to be a real point necessarily, uh, but sort of like this uh, like fictitious, let me do this, it's over here. Um, so you can see this particle is going up down this way, this particle is sort of going up a little faster. And so it turns out that there's a point that you can calculate from these, uh, these particles where they are, and it turns out that even like though these particles are doing something really wacky, this particle will always act like its own particle. You know, if you, if you, at every, every point in time you, you figure out where this center of mass is, it will always act like its own particle. Right? In this case, it's like sort of kind of like weird, you know, like who cares, right? But suppose I have like two particles that are, like are attracted to each other. And so the center of mass is like here, okay? And then like, and this one's moving maybe a little faster. And so like when, uh, sometime later in time, you know, it gets slowed down because it's attracted to that particle and then sort of like turns around, right? And at the same time, this one is sort of like going down and then it gets slowed down because it's being attracted. Uh, and so, you know, even though the individual particles are moving, the center of mass still behaves like, like an inertial, uh, or uh, like, a, like, a, like its own particle. And like, you know, that's kind of significant because that, that means like, for example, I am pre like, you know, composed of a large number of particles, right? But like this law basically says, I, just, I can treat myself as a single particle, like roughly speaking, right? And another picture that I would like to show is like, like suppose I have like two particles, you know, doing the same thing as before, um, not interacting, but suppose I like push on this particle to like make it speed up, but I don't do anything to this one. This particle sort of just goes down in a straight line. This particle actually starts speeding up. Like, like this way. It turns out the center of mass will also look like it's speeding up, right? It will look like a particle that's a feeling of force equal to the force you're applying to this one alone, right? So that's kind of interesting, right? Like you basically just add up all the forces on the individual particles, and, and that's fine. Okay, but we can, we can actually make that statement in a different way, right? We can say that um, 
the total uh, momentum of the problem is conserved. And what is the momentum exactly? Uh, the momentum is basically like, you know, how, like, roughly speaking, you know, how fast things are moving, right? Um, it's sort of like you add up all the directions of the motion, you add them together, um, and the heavier particles sort of contribute more to that number, right? And that's sort of a hand wavy explanation, right? But basically, you can think of it as you have the center of mass, uh, what is the motion of the center of mass, right? Um, if you do not apply any forces to the system, even if the system is applying forces to itself, momentum will be conserved. And that means that, like, you know, well, what I mean to say is that the center of mass will act like its own particle. And it will act like it doesn't have any forces on it, even though the particles within the system have that. Um, but here's the thing, right? Like I said, that, that's only true if there are no forces acting from outside, right? But even if there are forces acting from outside, I could just go ahead and, like, include that, like, the thing that's causing those forces in my system. For example, let's say I have like the sun, and then the moon, and the earth, and then the moon. Suppose I only wanted to care about these, uh, the earth uh, and the moon. Well, the thing is like the earth and the moon feel gravity from each other. They both feel gravity from the sun. And so the momentum of these two part, uh, these two, you know, the earth and the moon is not conserved. Okay. But what I could do instead is I could just redefine my problem to include the sun. And then, you know, in, in this point model, basically, I've included everything, right? And so what does that mean practically? It means, like, um, you know, like, even though, like, you know, everything is sort of moving around in this picture, the Earth is going around the sun, the moon is going around the Earth, there's always, if you calculate the center of mass, it will always be in the same spot, right? Uh, like, no matter what. Uh, and so this is called the conservation of momentum. Um, and it's, it sounds kind of vacuous, but basically what I'm saying is there's some number you can calculate for this system that does not change ever, which is which is you know really useful, right? Because you can you can it sort of goes back to determinism. You can sort of wait a long time and then you get to the future and then this this number is still not changed, right? And so that's that's interesting. You know we have a number that doesn't change, uh, unchanging number. So the question is, is that the only number that doesn't change? Okay. It turns out that it, it isn't. So in order to illustrate this example, um, suppose you are standing on a cliff and you have like a barrel, and you roll the barrel down. I'm just going to ask you guys uh, for a little bit of feedback. Suppose this hill was higher than, uh, like really high. Could you, uh, if you just dropped the barrel, uh, could you get it over here? Yes or no? Like, yes? Raise your hand, yes? Raise your hand, no? Okay. Yeah, right you guys think no. It'd probably just go up to here and then fall back down, right? And the, fur the further down it goes, like, the further down it is, the faster it's going, right? Um, similarly, if I made the hill really small, could, could, I, could I get over it? And in fact, you, have, like, you can get over any hill which is as high as you originally were, right? Which is, which is interesting as well, right? It, seem, it seems to suggest another conserved quantity. Right, you know, somehow like, uh, like the speed, like the, the fastness, uh, like either you're like you're really fast or you're really high. Plus highness, your highness, um, and this is called the energy. This is these are not words that people use. Sorry, this is called the kinetic energy, and it's called the potential energy. Um, and so this, this is, you know, a conserved quantity, right? If you think about it, right? Like if I, if I drop the ball, right, this number also doesn't change right, over time. Uh, yeah, and so it turns out that um, you can think of the, the, these hills as something called a potential. And, and I guess broadly what you can think of them as is like uh, how much potential energy something has when it is somewhere. Uh, this is actually a really important concept that you should like write down and remember. Like it, this will come up again, like in cosmology and particle physics everywhere. So, uh, the idea of a potential, the idea that uh, in certain places in three-dimensional space you have more energy, and in other places you have less. Uh, and you might, you might sometimes you might get into situations where like you know uh, you push a couch and then you sort of put in energy and then somehow the couch is not moving still, right? So it seems like nothing's happened. But you can always redefine energy to include other notions of energy, like heat energy or chemical energy, as if you're in chemistry you might know, uh, chemical 
And so it turns out that you can keep, even though like it seems like uh, sometimes there seems to be violations of conservation of energy, you can always keep defining your system in, uh, in, such, in such a way that uh, you, you sort of add to your definition. And then you come up with a number that is, doesn't change. And, and that, in, in a similar way to momentum, that is extremely useful. And one final thing, so this is conservation of energy. Can I erase this left board? Yeah. Um, have you ever, has anyone here ever ice skated? Oh, okay, so what happens when you um, are like spinning around and you put your arms in? Uh, yeah. You know why? It is interesting, isn't it? Have, also, one other example I'm not to try to get home. Don't do it now. But um, it, it, it's, it's, when you push on a door, you always push on it from like the, the hinge that is opposite, the, the, plate, the side that is opposite the hinge, right? You don't ever push on the direction of the hinge. That doesn't open the door, right? It's easier to open the door when you push on like the side that's like farthest away from the, the hinge. I can demonstrate. I think you guys have all have used the door before. But I think I would be really bad if I tried to open a door like this. Kind of sucks, right? um, but this is called the conservation of angular momentum. This is also kind of an important concept um, that will come up. Uh, basically, it's like the spinniness. Nobody uses that word either. Okay. And so, well, like intuitively, what that means is like something has more angular momentum when it is either uh, spinning, like rotating, or like let's see, um, like sort of moving faster, like perpendicularly to like the like an axis, or like it is farther away from that axis. That sounds kind of abstract, but let me explain. Uh, in, in, let's say like uh, in, the, in, the, in the analogy of an ice skater. So let's say the ice skater is like spinning around. This is going to be my ice skater. I need a helmet. I don't know. I don't know what ice skaters do. Um, and then so you know they, they spin around, right? But the thing is, as the ice skaters in the room know, if you put your arms in, in other words, if you move the mass closer to the center where you're rotating, right, you will spin faster. Uh, and in a way, like, even if you have an ice skate, you kind of already know this, right? Like, uh, it, it is sort of, um, yeah, this is, this is like, if you've ever been on, I don't know, you should try this sometime. You know? Basically, like, if you're spinning around, like, sometimes doing a physics class, they have, like, one of those swivel chairs, and, like, with, like, not that much friction, they spin you around, put your arms in, uh, and then you basically, like, you know, slow down. Or, sorry, you speed up, right? And so this is... Uh, so this is called angular momentum. <coughs> okay. Pardon? Yes. What about like with a windmill? Yeah. Would a bigger windmill? Uh, how would that? How would a bigger windmill compared to a smaller windmill? Would one go faster than the other? Uh, the so if they both have the same angular momentum, it turns out that the small windmill will go faster, right? Be because you know the bigger windmill, you need like things are farther away from the center, and yeah, so it would have to compensate by rotating slower to have the same angular momentum. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Uh, cool. And so one very handy application of this is gravity. Just sort of, you know, one pretty important. You don't want to like float off the space and uh, that would be bad. And so on your problem set, you'll deal with uh, this, this notion of the force of gravity. You do not have to know any, you, you do have to know how to plug into this equation. Uh, but we'll, it'll be pretty, I hope, hopefully explained well um, in the problem set. But, you know, feel free to ask if not. Um, the potential, you know, so I drew the potential for like some hills. Turns out the potential for gravity looks sort of like this, right? So, you know, if you're here and you sort of like fall down this hill, right? And then you would fall like down forever, but the earth stops you, right? Um, and yeah, one of the biggest problems in all of physics that was solved, you know, many hundreds of years ago was called the two body problem, uh, which is, if you think about it, really, really important. By the way, the, the notion of gravity is you have two objects with mass, they attract each other, right? Uh, they pull on each other and then they, like, they tend to get closer, right? Um, it's an attractive force, I should say that. Um, 
I think that's fairly intuitive, like you don't float off into space, uh, gravity doesn't push you away. Um, so the two-body problem is, like I said, a, hundred year old, a hundreds of year old problem that, that we, we eventually solve perfectly, right? No matter like, what configuration of two masses, we know the answer exactly, right? That's, that's important. So how do we, so that, what, that, what is the question exactly? It's basically you have two masses uh, and, and they're going in some directions, and the question is, what do they do for the rest of time? Like, can you predict what they do forever? Okay. It turns out we know the answer, right? Um, but, but let me just qualitatively work through how, how you get helped by these, um, these, um, uh, these conservation laws. The conservation of momentum. It's clear that like, if I'm only considering a universe with only these two masses, if I include them, nothing else can like, exert a, mass, a force on them, because that's everything. Um, and so they're, they're, they, the momentum of these two guys added together must be conserved. It must not change forever. So what does that mean? Um, broadly, what that means is that the, the center of mass uh, acts like a particle that doesn't feel any forces. Right? Um, and, and more specifically, if you like, sort of go into the frame of that system, it looks like the center of mass isn't moving at all, okay. which is interesting. It, it means, like, for example, if you consider a universe where we only have the sun and the Earth, it's not that the Earth is rotating around the Sun. It's more, it's more like the Earth and the Sun are both rotating around their center of mass. The Sun is still rotating around the center of mass, but because it's so much more massive, the center of mass is so much closer to it. Does that make sense? Um, and so in that sense, the two-body problem, uh, like this helps us by saying uh, like uh, things rotate around the center of mass. Um, what about the conservation of energy? Well, notice how when the particles are closer together, they actually have less energy, okay? Uh, less potential energy. But because energy is conserved, that means that that energy has to, has to have gone to kinetic energy, which means that when two like you know planets or you know the Earth and the Moon are closer together, right? They're actually moving faster, right? So, for example, if I had like, uh, for example, um, there's a there's a there's an object in the solar system called Sedna, which has an orbit that looks like this. So this is the sun. Uh, this is like Sedna, and it turns out that it will like sort of zoom around really fast. Actually, not super fast because it's really far away, but it will uh, zoom around relatively fast when it's close to the sun, and then when it's far away from the sun, it will like take forever. Um, and so you can get that from conservation of energy. And as for conservation of momentum. Um, uh, angular momentum. You know, if you have a particle, uh, if you have, um, um, you know, some system that where like you accidentally, like without any influence from the like outside, you accidentally get this uh, planet like going in further in, then it will like necessarily spin faster around the, the star, right? Okay, so that's that's one example of like how conserved quantities help us, although like, it is admittedly like sort of like contrived. Well, not really, I guess. Okay, so I'm going to erase what's on the top board. And um, I want to post you this question. Maybe think about it for like a minute, um, and maybe give me your suggestions. So I've, I've shown you uh, how many conserved quantities. Well, I've, I've, I've mentioned three, but actually momentum and angular momentum, right? Like those are actually each three, because uh, momentum is sort of like in three directions in, in space, and angular momentum is along three axes in space, roughly speaking. Um, so you know, so that, that's a total of three plus three plus seven uh, plus sorry three plus three plus one conserved quantities, where energy is one. Uh, so that's seven conserved quantities. That's like a lot of conserved quantities, right? If you define your system in the proper way. Um, my question is, how come we got so lucky? How come there are so many conserved quantities? This is where we sort of get off the beaten track of seven A or eight A or whatever. Um, does anyone have any idea? Certainly, you guys at least see why that's weird. Like, why is it that our universe contrived so that seven numbers, seven entire numbers, never change, ever? Does that seem weird to any, any of you guys? Like, it's begging for a reason, right? At least, like, like where do these numbers come from that, that, that help us out? And so, um, it turns out there's something called Noether's theorem, which is, um, as st is stated, and I do not think this is an exaggeration, probably uh, one of the most important theorems in all of uh, physics. Uh, I'm not going to explain it. Without 
about doing any work where you just say, oh, well, because conservation momentum comes from this symmetry, we don't have it anymore. Okay. And, that, and if you think about it, that's right, right? Because if I put a particle here, and I sort of like let it go, and it sort of flops around, and then it sort of goes the other way, you can see that its, like, it's direction of motion has changed. So its direction of motion has changed, and therefore its momentum hasn't been maintained. But like I said, it's really dependent on how you define your system. So if I, instead of defining my system to be just the particle, I define it to be everything. Then in shifting things to the right, I'd also have to shift this potential to the right, right? And you can see in that picture, things are the same. Okay. Yeah? Is it not considered symmetric because the ball on the right um, why, like why? Why is it not considered symmetric? It's not considered symmetric because like you've modified, you've made a change to the system that will result in something different happening. So like maybe the ball on the left only drops one foot, and the ball on the right drops like five. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Roughly speaking, like for example, you can see that this ball on the left is at a higher energy than this one, or at a higher potential than this one. Right? Do you see that? Higher potential energy. Right. So like uh, potential as in it's, it's high it's like higher on the hill. Yeah. 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 Like that that's pretty clear, right? Mm -hmm. So that's already a difference. Like you don't want this kind of difference if there's a symmetry. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Um, and so um, there's another kind of symmetry, um, uh, which which is important is called time translational symmetry. So suppose instead of suppose that like like I were like God or whatever and I shifted everything in the universe. 10 seconds forward, okay, everything. Would anything happen differently? That's a question. Uh, yes, no, yes, no? The answer is no, right? Uh, because like, I mean, if you think about it, it you can think about it uh, sort of like from whoops, your perspective. You can like, the fact that you're able to like, you have a watch, you're able to set it forward or backwards, and like you still like operate correctly as a person it means that there's no difference what you call like one time or another. Do you see what I mean? Um, and so, um, and so, um, suppose I, I have this ball, and I say shift everything forward ten seconds in time. Okay, well the ball's still there, it's still going to do the same thing, which is like nothing, or, or go in whatever direction it was going. Uh, similarly, if I have these hills and I have this ball. Um, and then like 10 seconds later, it's still there. Okay, you see that? Um, and so it's even a symmetry when it comes to like, like hills. Okay. Uh, does anyone know what uh, conserve quantity leads to? I don't have a guess. Energy. Yeah. Later on, uh, it turns out actually, as, as an aside, um, uh, like you know, hundreds of years later, Einstein actually uh, viewed space and time as being sort of one continuous fabric, and you can sort of see in that picture that um, energy and momentum are sort of like the same thing in that picture. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, suppose you had a potential that were changing in time. It's like hills that were like moving. It's kind of creepy, but you know, it could happen, I guess. Uh, and so, like, let's say later on in time, this hill actually lifted up. Okay. You can see that, like, there's no time translational symmetry here. You know, like, the potential itself changes with time. Do you see that? Um, however, if I included the hills in my system, then not only would I have to translate this ball forward in time, I'd also have to translate the hills forward in time. So if I include everything in my system, then I'm okay. Does that make sense? Um, and finally, um, and I'm just going to have you venture to guess, maybe take like a minute to think about it with your neighbors. Um, what symmetry causes angular momentum conservation? Do you have a guess? Um, maybe take like a minute to think about it, like talk to your neighbor or something. You want to ask you one more time? Um, what, what symmetry do you think causes angular momentum to not change? Like that's the spinning, the spinning quantity, right? It has to do with spinning. Yeah.
You guys have a guess? Is it rotation? Yes. If I rotate the entire universe by 10 degrees, does anything change? No, right? I mean, like, of course, your description of the universe might change, but fundamentally, everything happens the same way. Does everyone see why that's the case? Because you included everything. Because I include everything. And I'm not going to do the same exercise, but you can hand wavingly see how, as long as you include enough things, right, um, you're good. Question? Uh, question? Yeah. Yeah. So I sort of generally get the fact that we have this thing that's angular momentum, and we also have this thing called relational rotational symmetry, and I get that if you rotate everything, it leads to nothing changing. Correct. Right. Everything is sort of still the same relative mm -hmm. to everything else, and if everything is still the same, it might have changed. Right. But I don't fully get how that means that you that angular momentum is conserved. So that's the statement of Noether's theorem. It's like not it's not like a very intuitive thing. Like can that's we, why it was can very. Can we get the statement of Noether's theorem then? And then yeah, the statement of Noether's theorem is if you have a conserve, uh, sorry, if you have a continuous symmetry that causes some quantity to be conserved, that is the statement. It, it, the actual mathematical statement actually tells you which one it is too, but. Um, this is the statement, right? This is this is the fundamental thing. Is that uh, that might be restating a point? Like, is there any way? I, I guess I don't fully understand like why. Like why this is true? Yeah. Uh, there's not really an intuitive reason I can think of. Okay. But besides these examples, right? Um, you can. I I think we'll get to points where we will conserve quantities that like don't seem to be related to the thing. But in, in physics, what will happen is sometimes people will like. Oftentimes, people will notice a continuous symmetry and be like, okay. What is the quantity associated with it? And oftentimes, it's not something you expected, something really complicated or messy. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't give a more satisfying answer to that. Um, and so we can see now why we have so many conserved quantities is because our laws are very symmetric, right? OK, uh, let's take a detour to like some example of a thing, which is called the harmonic oscillator. It's every physicist's favorite object because uh, we model everything as a harmonic oscillator, or a sphere, or an ideal gas. Um, so let's go with harmonic oscillator for now. What is a harmonic oscillator? Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. It's OK if you haven't. Uh, it's basically something that wiggles back and forth, like in a normal way. Let me draw a picture. So the potential uh, is like, just imagine a hill that's sort of shaped like a parabola, like x squared. Okay, like of the sort that you, you studied in school. Um, okay, this is called a harmonic oscillator. And there's some very important things to know about it. Uh, first of all, it describes a lot of things, right? So if you have a, if I have a normal, like a normal like spring, um, and I have like a mass attached to it, and I sort of like pull it, it will sort of wiggle back and forth, like a harmonic oscillator. Or if I have like, um, it turns out if I have like the earth, and I drill a hole through it, and it's not rotating, and I go through, and I sort of wiggle back and forth, that's also a harmonic oscillator. If I have a pendulum that swings back and forth like a like a like a mass on a string, that's also a harmonic oscillator. Okay, and so turns out that um, it's a very general phenomenon, and it's actually also a very nice phenomenon in the sense that um, one one thing you should know about it is uh, let's say I have like two masses here and I just put them both in the uh, harmonic oscillator like this. Turns out that if I let them both go, they're all gonna, they're both going to come to the center at exactly the same time. Why? Because this one is farther up, so it gets sort of like falls down this hill steeper, so it speeds up. But this one's also closer, so it turns out it exactly cancels out, right? Uh, and so like it turns out that the oscillator, like the frequency at which this oscillates, you know, how often it goes back and forth, does not depend on how high you put it. And so it's a really, uh, really interesting system. Um, and so let's take another detour. Uh, I should not have used the upper. Uh, okay, we're going to go to another formulation of 
uh, mechanics, which is even more powerful than the one I said before. Uh, this is called Hamiltonian mechanics. It has nothing to do with ham, even though it's close to dinner time. Um, so I'm going to call this phase space. William Brown Hamilton, and he came up with this around about 1833, uh, and it was sort of uh, a, a yet another formulation of classical mechanics, which is totally unintuitive and totally like weirdly unequivalent, but somehow is like this, like it gives the right answers, the exact same answers for everything. But what uh, Hamilton basically did was he viewed the universe in terms of um, phase space. This idea of phase space. What is phase space? Okay. So in real life, we have you know like real space, you know, three dimensions of real space, and in addition, each of those, uh, you know, if you have a, uh, some object, that object can also be moving in each of those three directions with some momentum in each of those three directions. His insight, um, which maybe was not entirely his, uh, was to envision the motion in each of those directions as its own direction in space, like in a, in, in a space that he imagined called space space. Why would that be important, right? Well, so recall that in order to know what a particle will do right now, all you need to know about it, everything you can know about it is where it is and where it is going, right? So a point in phase space corresponds to basically like everything that will happen in the future. Do you see what I mean? Like, if you know where someone is in phase space, you know everything about them, okay? Whereas if you know where someone is in real space, you don't because you don't know which way they're going. Does that make sense? So he, he envisions putting like momentum and position on the same footing. Okay. And um, so that's called phase space. And let's see. And his branch of physics, uh, his branch of uh, theorist formulation is called Hamiltonian mechanics. Um, and so let's draw that. Yes. Sorry, I have a question about phase space. Yeah. So you said if you know where something is in phase space. Yeah, you know everything that will happen to it. You know everything that will happen to it because you know where it is relative to every single thing. Because that you know exists. where you, because because when you because phase space is basically a point like when you when you know your point in phase space, you know where you are exactly and you also know which direction and how fast you're going because you know your momentum. Like in phase but space, do you, do you have to know where other things are relative to you? Uh yes, so like that's actually included in the phase space. So in general, if you have n particles, like this is not really relevant, but if you have like n number of particles, you have six n dimensions in phase space. Three for each position and three for each momentum. And n because n particles. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So let's let's try and envision it, right? Because usually phase space is like more than three dimensions, so you can't imagine it. But for an oscillator, because it only has one number that you need to describe it, or two, I guess, because the speed and the position. It's easy to imagine it because you can just draw it. Actually, let's and let's think of like a like a let's use your intuition for a pendulum. So let's say it displaces the pendulum will be like this. This is the I'm gonna use p for the momentum and x for the position, uh, just so it's clear, I guess. Okay, so let's say uh, we we put the, the mass here, we displace it, we let it go. Okay, what's gonna happen is first it's like displaced to the, the left, right? Right? Does that, do you see that? It's like on the, it's, at first it's on the left. But it's also not moving, so it's like doesn't it's not uh, it doesn't it's on it's zero on the y-axis, right? But later on, if I let it go for a bit, it's gonna sort of fall down, and then it's gonna be like at the bottom, but it's gonna be moving to the right. You see that? So what's gonna happen is actually now the position is zero, but the momentum is going to the right, so it's actually up here. Okay. And then similarly, it's gonna be back here. It's gonna come to the other side, and because of conservation of energy, it's gonna stop. But it's going to be on the right, and you can see that if you if you think about it, um, it actually is a circle in phase space. It just goes in, uh, more like it's more like an ellipse, but like basically you can think of it as a circle. And moreover, like it doesn't matter where you are, you sort of spiral around. And you can see that in phase space, it becomes very clear that what you're really doing is following these arrows around. You're following these sort of like currents in phase space. Right. Any question? Yeah. Um, is the, the the origin of the graph? Mm -hmm. uh, that's that. Is that, the, is that like the the the, con 
the concave or the apex of the wave right, so that, at that point? So that corresponds to the particle that is not moving at all. So obviously okay. if a particle never moves uh, from the beginning and it's at the center, then it will never ever move. Right? So you can see how like, it just gets stuck yeah. there. Right? Um, and it turns out, uh, for, for, it turns out that the, the pendulum, by the way, as an aside, is not a perfect oscillator. Actually, what happens is, if you look really closely on the, on the pendulum's face space, it will look like this. But if you think about it, right, if I like, displace the pendulum like, really far and I push it, it's just going to go in a circle forever. Right? It's not going to oscillate back and forth. Do you see that? Like, if, if the string is like, like a rod, like if I push it, it will just sort of go in a circle forever. And so actually what the face space ends up looking like is it will look like an eye. So if you look really closely, it looks like an oscillator. But it zoom out, it looks like an eye, like this. And then like there, are, then the, the 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 currents corresponding to going in a circle forever are these ones. And you can look it up. You can look up phase space of a pendulum, and you'll see this. It's really quite beautiful. Uh, and so you can see, you can probably, I probably, hopefully, have convinced you that looking at the problem this way, you sort of see like things that disentangle, right? Like, uh, how things move is a lot more clear. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to really talk about exactly what it is that Hamilton did or what Hamiltonian mechanics is, but it basically it's framed along this stage of phase space, right? Uh, which is also incredibly important. Now we get to the final topic, which is the, a huge payload in my opinion. We'll get there quite early, in fact, I think. Um, so 45 minutes. Um, and so, uh, something called chaos. Um, by the way, you might think of like this as being like sort of done, like known science, but actually people, you know, there's a professor here actually, uh, Edgar Knobloch, whose work is actually nonlinear dynamics. People are still figuring stuff about this out, right? What is chaos? Has anyone ever heard this word before? It probably has been used recently to describe, I don't know, like the primary or the election or the last election. <laughs> um, but, you know, you probably have some inkling of what, what that word means. It sort of sounds like negative, like you can't really, you know, like things are sort of like, chaotic, like you can't predict what's going on, right? Um, yeah, and so that, that sort of qualitatively is what that word means. Um, yeah, uh, but so what is chaos really? So the definition people usually use is like sensitivity to initial conditions. Um, extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. What does that mean exactly? Well, suppose I have a harmonic oscillator. Okay. If I, um, so it's going to sort of swing back and forth, right? If I put the harmonic, if I start it off up here, will something fundamentally different happen? I mean, like, you know, there's a tiny difference, right? But like, you know, these, these like, really like this particle is also going to go back and forth sort of similarly. Right? It's going to be sort of like going to be in a really close trajectory to the other one, right? And it's going to stay like that pretty much forever. Okay. Does that sound like a thing you can believe? Um, and so, and so, so in this sense, the harmonic oscillator is not sensitive to initial conditions. If you change it where it is from the beginning or what it's doing from the beginning, it might change what it's doing at the end a little bit, but like sort of not that much. Okay. The chaos is like not that. Chaos is, is something different. Um, and for a prototypical example, I'm going to show this animation soon. Um, I don't know if we have the ability to project. <laughs> yeah, let's let's can we can we turn on the projector? I'll try, I'll try. Uh, I, yeah, I don't I don't know how that works. Um, but in the meantime, the prototypical example is not the single pendulum, which is not chaotic, but the double pendulum. Which you probably saw in a science museum before, right? So basically, you have two rods, one with a mass, and then another rod with another mass. Have you have you seen this before? This is called a double pendulum. And I don't know what you expect to happen, but actually what happens is it's very, very chaotic. It's very hard to predict what will happen. In fact, if you sort of change what's in even the tiniest way what it is from the beginning, it will do completely different things later on. Right? Because like sort of like the changes will accumulate over time. And it will just do completely random stuff. And so there are um, so there's one concept which uh, I thought was pretty cool. Um, first of all, um, I'm not, I'm, this, this reason will become clear a little bit later, but it turns out that in, if you only have one di direction like this, uh, what, sorry, you only have one coordinate, you won't actually get chaos, but uh, suppose you have like many, many coordinates, right? Like many, many numbers you need to describe your system. 
Um, well, what I told you before was that phase space, like for example, for the harmonic oscillator, um, sort of looks like smooth. It looks like it has like um, like currents that tell you where to go. Okay. Uh, and so um, and so you know you put yourself here, and it tells you, it carries you forward for all the time. You can see how uh, what I, what I really mean by not chaotic is that you know if you have two paths, they sort of like follow each other. They might stretch out or whatever, but they're sort of like usually close to each other. What happens when you have chaos? If you like slice through the phase space, notice how phase space is a super huge dimensional thing. What will actually happen is you'll have like these bubbles that start to form, right? Like so, like these these lines will sort of get destroyed, and then each of them will become a little circle, okay? And then each of those little things will become a circle, like a smaller circle. Each of those will become a circle, and so on. So you'll get like this like shredded phase space, where even though like technically speaking, the future is determined by the past, right? You're basically like destroyed your phase space, right? Um, and, that's, and that's the sense in which you have chaos. Okay. Um, but that's peculiar, right? Like, why would such a thing be a, you know, why would that be a thing? Um, actually, let's, let's go over here. Yeah, do you have a question? Is that something similar to microstates? Uh, micros, in what sense? When it comes to like entropy. Yeah, so, yeah, well, I mean, so that's sort of a different concept of a cinema, right? If you have a lot of particles in a gas, for example, uh, I think it would be fair to call that uh, if, if the gas is interacting, that would be chaotic. Okay. Like if, if it's a bunch of particles in a subcluster, that study, it would be chaotic. But it turns out, uh, you, we'll, we'll talk about this in a few weeks, that if you have a lot of things, uh, that they actually somehow, like, be, like hidden behavior emerges from that, uh, that you wouldn't have expected, uh, which is related to microstates. Can, can, that's sort of a prelude. Okay, so this is working, is that right? You guys got this? Okay, this animation is already finished. Okay, so this was just from the beginning uh, an example of rotational forces. So, right, like the t like the the top is what like is actually like from the it's from the ground frame, right, the non-rotating frame. You can see that the particle is just moving forward, but in the but in the rotating frame, if you pretend that like the disc, if you think the disc is not moving, you can see that it looks like things are actually twisting to the side, right? And so that like that's called the Coriolis force, and that causes like hurricanes and stuff. Um, that don't hit Alabama. Um, this is an example of the single pendulum. Uh, it's kind of like a bad animation, but basically you can see it's going back and forth, and here's the phase space. It's just going in a circle with phase space. This is the double pendulum. Okay. You can see that just basically does weird shit uh, forever. Uh, and it does weird shit. Uh, it does even, like, it does just really different stuff, right? Um, yeah, and so this is another example, right? The two-body problem, as I said, is not chaotic because you can predict everything about it forever, okay? The three-body problem, however, is um, if you change one thing about the three-body problem, everything is different, right? Like, broadly speaking. Sometimes, like, there are regimes in which that isn't true, but broadly speaking, if you have three particles, you cannot predict what they're going to do in general. They're just going to go in random directions and stuff. And uh, the last thing I want to show you is what I meant by like shredding your phase space, right? Um, basically, like you can see, like there used to be trajectories, but you add something that makes your system chaotic. And you can see that there are like these bubbles that form, these circular bubbles, and then each of those has like its own bubbles and so on forever. It's like a fractal-like structure, infinitely detailed, right? And that's what chaos looks like. Okay. Now, uh, the last thing I want to talk to you guys about is. Where chaos actually comes from, right? I mean, like it seems like I said, it seems like a very peculiar thing uh, that that happens. Okay. Let me erase this before. We've listed a few examples of systems which are chaotic and which are not chaotic. So as a reminder, is the single pendulum chaotic? Okay. How many numbers do you need to describe everything about the single pendulum? So yeah, so one point, but so two. Right? So like how fast it's moving and also where it is. So we'll have that because, because one of them is related to how the other is moving, right? We'll just say that, right? 
how many coordinates. By coordinates, I mean how many numbers you need to describe where it is. Not necessarily how fast it's moving, but where it is. So we'll say one plus momentum. So like, you know, it has the same number of momentum. Okay. Um, what about the double pendulum? Is that chaotic? Yes. No. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yes. Okay. Uh, how many numbers do you need to describe this one? How many coordinates and how many momenta? Momentum. So two coordinates. How many momenta? Also two. These are always going to be equal. It's the pattern. Um, and uh, okay. So what about um, the two-body problem? Or the one-body problem? How about the one-body problem? It's the particle under gravity's influence, but there's no other particle in the universe, so it just goes in a straight line. Is that chaotic? No, because you can predict everything about it, right? So it's a one-body problem. How many numbers do you need to describe uh, where it is? How many? Uh, another guess? Four. No. Nope. No. <laughs> Three. Where, where is the particle right now? You need three numbers, right? Yeah. X, Y, and Z. And so how many momenta? Three, all right, okay. What about the two-body problem? Yes? Uh, don't you need, like, the energy? Uh, right, but the thing is that the energy actually, once you know the position and momenta, you can calculate the energy. That's okay. the point. All right. Uh, what about the uh, two-body problem? Is it chaotic? No, it's not. If it were chaotic, then we'd be pretty screwed because we're living on a two-body problem. Actually, we're living on like a many-body problem, but you know, Earth and Sun are approximately two bodies. So, uh, how many numbers do you need to describe the two-body problem? Six. That's right. Uh, uh, six, like six coordinates, six momenta. Okay. Three-body problem. This will, this tedious exercise will become the purpose for this tedious exercise will become very clear. Three body problem. It's very famously not solvable. In fact, um, what's, you know, I mean, the natural thing to do is like, you know, um, people back then were like, oh, we, we just solved the two body problem. Of course, the next thing we're going to do is solve the three body problem. That, that shouldn't be too much harder. It's only like one more body, right? <laughs> but it turns out that it was so bad that like after a few hundred years, people like actually proved that you can't. <coughs> so that kind of sucks. So, I mean, like, I've basically given away the answer over and over again. The answer is yes, it is chaos. How many numbers do you need to describe it? What number goes here? Nine. Nine. Okay, and so on. You can see that like it would become even more chaotic over time, or with more bodies. Okay. Uh, now I want you to think about the symmetries. What are the symmetries of the single pendulum? Like, just think of the ones that I told you about, because that's all of them that will be. So, uh, what what uh, so gravity points down. Okay. So what what uh, symmetries does it have? Does it have translational symmetry? In the sense that if I change the angle, does it do the same thing? Yes or no? Yes. No. The answer is no. It doesn't. Right. Because if if I pull the pendulum up, it will actually sort of oscillated at a higher, you know, higher amplitude, right? So that's not a symmetry. The answer will be different if you have a translation. What about um, angular momentum? I mean, surely it's like a rotation, right? So like angular momentum is, is one, right? Do you guys agree with that? Yes? No? Do you guys have an opinion at all? Do you have a guess? Yes? Yes. No? It's actually no, right? Because if you rotate, uh, uh, let, me, let me think. Think of the best way to put this. Um, it, the gravity points down. It defines a special direction, right? If you rotate away from that direction, right, you're at a different relationship to gravity, okay? and so it actually isn't a symmetry anymore. Okay. I mean, it would be if you like included like what the pendulum was attached to plus everything else, but we're not doing that, right? Um, we're we're sort of in a world where uh, we don't care about that. What about time translation? Symmetry. It's a symmetry. 
And how many is that? How many symmetries of the seven have, do I have? A space is that when you have a conserved quantity in Hamiltonian mechanics, you can always change your coordinates like in some abstract way so that your momenta, the corresponding to those coordinates, don't change. Because you can just pick those momenta to be your conserved quantities. So if you have, like, that might be sort of vague, and so if this doesn't make any sense, it's sort of a, an aside, so it doesn't really matter. But um, if, if you have, like, some number of conserved quantities, right, and you have some number of coordinates, you can always shift, in, in Hamiltonian mechanics, you can, like, shift your coordinates um, so that, like, the momenta co coincide with numbers that don't change. And because you, when you do that, it actually turns out that those, those numbers become very easy. Because you know things are just moving around <coughs> constantly, right? Like with like like linearly, like um, like they're not doing anything weird. They're just fixed. I don't know if does that like hand wavingly make sense. Um, but what I want you to notice is this. Okay, is one bigger than one, or is is one greater than or equal to one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's true, right? Yes. Actually, let, let's actually no. I think it's the other way. Yeah, no, no, yeah, okay. One as in this one. One, one greater than or equal to one. Yes. Is um is one greater than or equal to two? No. No. Okay. Is is seven greater than or equal to three? Yes. Is seven greater than or equal to six? Yes. Is seven greater than or equal to nine? No. Do you see the pattern? Yes. Okay. So what does it mean when you have chaos? What causes chaos? More, more, more. Yes. Right. So broadly speaking, it's like a lack of symmetry. Do you see? I bet that that's not something they tell you in second grade every day, right? Although it'd be really helpful if they did. So that's the concept of integra integrability, right? And so I have like seven minutes left, so I can just talk a little bit about a little bit more about what, what exactly I mean. Um, I don't know. Before before that, actually, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, the seven symmetries. So the first three are spatial translation. Right. The last one is rotational. Uh, three rotations. Because there's rotation this way, rotation this way, and rotation ah, okay. the other way. Three rotations. And what's the last one? Uh, time translation. Ah, time translation. Yeah. Yes? What's the first question? That, that same question? Anything else? I mean, this should be blowing your mind. I don't know. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> It's pretty insane. You can see how people still study this kind of stuff, um, and and especially like you know these chaotic systems is still like a subject of um, yeah of, of research. Um, I guess I can sort of go a little bit further with my description because we do have a little bit of extra time. I hope I, I hope that wasn't too fast. Um, uh, by the way, you won't need most of that information for the problem set, but I would appreciate if you understood like things like the potential and motivation. <coughs> Because they will come up again, because like I said, they're the most important concepts in physics or something. Uh, um, I guess this is an even more uh, illustrious aside. Um, I guess um, one way you can, okay. I actually have a lot of freedom to tell you about whatever I want. Isn't that <laughs> um, so I'll tell you about, I'll tell you about um, two concepts. Okay, that's enough. Um, so when you're in phase space, um, you have like some some coordinates. I'm going to call x1 through xn, like just a lot of coordinates, and to each of them you have a momentum. Okay, uh, that's just like your space. So for example, like if I have one particle, that's like three coordinates and then three momentum corresponding to the three directions of motion, right? Uh, you don't have to care about these letters. You, you just have to care that there are six n of them. Right? This is how big your phase space is. Okay. Um, and the idea, what, I, what I'm basically saying is, suppose you had a bunch of conserved quantities, okay? It turns out that just as you can change your coordinates in real space, you can also change your coordinates when you're doing, dealing with Hamiltonian mechanics uh, in phase space. And so you, you can change your coordinates to pick these guys to be conserved. So I'm going to call C for conserved. And you can see that like, if I have a number of conserved quantities, then because, um, because the momentum is related to how fast the position is changing, right? That means that the position basically changes in a very predictable way. So you can see if I have enough conserved quantities, I can pick all of my momentum to be conserved. And then, uh, uh, yeah, Cn. 
and, and then all of my positions will behave predictably. And if I can't do that, then they'll behave unpredictably. Right? That's, that's sort of like what the math looks like. Okay, yeah. Wait, so you're saying that you can change the momentum to stay at, a, at the same mm -hmm. number that's out, so right. that you can get all the positions above it? Mm -hmm. So you, yeah, so then the, because you know what the momentum is for all time, position will just move predictably, like in one direction forever. In fact, in fact, it will actually go around and in a circle forever. And so people will say things like, if you ever read about the dynamics, they'll talk about like tori or toruses, you know, torus, if you go around in a torus, you end up in the same spot again. <coughs> like, anyway, that doesn't matter, I guess. One other result that I wanted to talk about, and then we didn't put it into the lecture, but we have three minutes left, uh, which is, this is a very uh, short thing to state. You also don't need to know this, but uh, it's called Louisville's theorem, which you might not have heard of before. Basically, if you, uh, this is the statement. You know, I'll, I, I'll leave you to think about why it's true. But suppose uh, I had a phase space, like, like the one over there, or except without the bubbles in it, right? And I have like um, a whole bunch of particles, like, like I, I have a laboratory where I have a bunch of pendula, okay? And they all like, so I'm just experimenting with them. And, I, and like, you know, I put one pendula at this point, and one at this point, and one at this point, and I sort of, have a whole bunch of pendula that are at different points in phase space. I just want to look at them, okay? And I have like a camera for each one of them. And then later on, I want to figure out like what exactly happens to them, right? So later on, I figure out where this end pendulum ends up, let's say it ends up here, and this one ends up here, and then eventually all the pendula end up at, at this different point. It's like some weird, other weird blob, okay? Does, it, does that problem, like, it might sound like kind of contrived, but do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, the situation? So this, this will become in general some really messed up looking blob, like, you know, I don't know, some really messed up thing. Lufield's theorem basically says that even though the blob looks really different, the area of the blob is always going to be the same. In other words, like, if you imagine uh, these, these, uh, these particles as being like a, a liquid inside this weird phase space, the liquid can't get stretched or squeezed. It can like sort of, like, get stretched out in this sense, but it will have to like contract in the other direction, right? It's sort of like, you can't, you can't like make it more dense. Does that, does that make sense? I'll leave you to think about why intuitively that's true, but it turns out that it is, and that's, that's pretty cool, I guess. Um, and so that, that's it. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, um, your homework is due on Monday uh, before class next week. We also have a discussion where we'll just tell you about some really cool other stuff. That is that you know doesn't really fit into the main body of the lecture. Uh, but other than that, uh, thank you guys. Thank you.